Hey, welcome in to the Email Design Podcast. You know it is the best place to get all your news about email design, development, and marketing. We are your hosts for the program. I am Kevin Mandeville. And I am Jason Rodriguez. We got a great episode of the podcast coming up here today. We're going to be talking about accessibility, talking about payments in email, a new email redesign project, and even, I think, one of the biggest, biggest groundbreaking things, news to happen Uh not only an email, but the web. Um, but yeah, Jason, let's kick it off talking about uh, a snapshot of email professionals. Yeah, we'll, we'll make people wait for your most exciting news that, <laughs> that I know you yeah. really love. Yeah. Uh, so first, we want to kick it off, start start talking about uh, the snapshot of email professionals in 2017. Uh, so this is a really cool blog post from Chad White over on the Litmus blog uh, that takes a lot of the information that we found from the state of email survey uh, for 2017, which we talked about in last week's episode, um, and pulls out some really key information about professionals working in the email industry. Um, so there's some really cool kind of high-level stuff here going on, some demographics, how people work, what they actually work on. Um, so the things that I found really interesting were, yeah, these kind of demographics. So he found out that the majority of people working in the email industry are essentially millennials. There's that 25 to 34 age range, um, which I think is kind of funny because there's always this talk online about millennials not having anything to do with email. Um, and it turns out that most of the email industry is made up of that kind of target age range, which I, I, I thought was interesting. Um, uh, he found out, you know, that the vast majority of people in the industry have three or more years of email marketing experience, which is pretty cool to see. Um, a lot of people have even more than that, you know, like, uh, five to seven, eight plus years at 22%. So a lot of really experienced people in the industry, which is cool. I think the, one of the most telling stats though, is that email professionals perform 4.4 out of 10 tasks that we ask them about. Um, so I think this really speaks to the fact that email email professionals uh, have a lot of different duties. So we ask them about email coding, designing strategy, um, dealing with analytics and performance analysis, uh, email planning, management of email marketing accounts, clients, and projects, uh, as well as overseeing all of the email marketing channel, copywriting, other marketing activities, and other business operations. Um, so a lot of different types of tasks and skill sets. And most professionals did at least four of those things, if not more. Um, so I think this is really interesting to look at. There's we we think a lot of times solely about email designers on the show or like at Limus or uh, people that deal with just marketing, but I think we need to expand that as an industry and take into account the, all the different duties that people have to do throughout their careers because there's a lot more. So maybe people don't have as much time to focus on coding and development because they're dealing with all these other things on their plate. Um, so I thought that was really, really interesting. And then there's some other stuff about company size and industry, uh, but those were the kind of main takeaways that I found from this, this post by Chan. Yeah, and I, I thought it was really cool to see that it's pretty much a split between men and women. Right? Yeah, so. yeah. 52%, 48% women. So there isn't that much of a discrepancy between any gender gap for the most part. Um, and I think where it especially leans is is more so you always see it on the development side. But when you mm -hmm. get into the marketing world, there isn't that much of a gender gap. So that's good to see. Um, and then, yeah, with the whole, the age group and then the tasks, This I think this really just points to we have an issue, and even in our our interviews that we're doing on the podcast, Jason, there's an issue, there's a disconnect between what management expects out of e individuals performing email roles and their experience and sort of what their perception of email is versus the reality, mm -hmm. right? They expect that it's this really quick and easy thing to do that yep. somebody non-experienced can do, that anybody can do it, and that's really just such a false myth. And I don't know how we solve that issue, but I think there is a clear issue of the actual decision makers and the people in power of, of upper management, use that term loosely for anybody who has sort of a, a higher stakeholder presence. Um, there's a disconnect there. And I don't know how we solve that as an industry, but that definitely exists. And this research backs it up. Yeah, definitely. I think that's, that's kind of, there was a funny thread in the email geek Slack channel about somebody was tasked with building nine responsive email templates from scratch yeah. in the course of a week. Um, Customs. Which is, yeah, which is a pretty tall, tall task to actually undertake. 
Um, and I, I think, uh, yeah, a lot of it's education, but even that, a lot of times stakeholders don't really listen to what we present them present to them around education and about the realities of working with email. So it's it's definitely a challenging thing to try to figure out, and I absolutely don't have the solution. So yeah, we're, unfortunately, we're not going to solve it here in this podcast. Yeah, yeah, but- I, I think this would be really good fodder for like an interesting panel or webinar or something like that. Maybe we could get a bunch of people online and talk about them about this topic. But yeah, definitely interesting yeah. at all to take into account. Yeah. So you're not alone out there if you feel this way. And yeah, we need to brainstorm as a community, which is why we're bringing this up. We need to brainstorm how, what can we do to to make everybody's lives in our industry better, you know, knowing this information. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about some breaking news. This is some like amazing stuff, in my opinion. Turn your speakers up if you've sort of faded out there at that last one. Uh, CSS Grid which maybe not everybody is even familiar with at this point, but essentially CSS grid is now supported in 77% of browsers. So it went from like 0% to what? 77% in like, like, like in a month. Like yeah. Three weeks, like it's three like weeks. Cr- time. Firefox hit Chrome hit Safari hit. Safari hit. Yeah. Uh, I'm not and sure so- if opera has, has it or not. I'll uh, check that one out. Uh, I'm actually not sure what the official release date is, but I believe that's even coming too. But yeah. yeah so th- CSS Grid is a new way to handle and manage your layouts in CSS. So we went from floats to Flexbox, and Flexbox has been the traditional way now of sort of managing layouts on the web. And now there is CSS Grid. And why this is important for email is that CSS Grid is now even supported in email thanks to this update because we have several email clients that are tied to, tied to this browser rendering. So Apple Mail 10.3, iOS, AOL, Auto Mail, and even Outlook for Mac supports CSS Grid. Uh, you can see the tweet here from Mark Robbins showing screenshots, uh, showing some basic tests, and this works. And this is amazing because I know at least for us at Limus, ever since the Gmail update, we have been slowly converting our email newsletters to use a div-based approach mm-hmm. and only using tables as outlook conditionals and fallbacks because the only email client that you need tables for is the microsoft word rendering engine Mm -hmm. and so what's great about this approach is that we can now progressively enhance seamlessly to using css grid as an enhancement without having to change our html structure at all and the way that you can do this if you take a look at this code that mark has here if you simply use the at supports uh sort of function you can determine what clients uses or support CSS grid and then put all of your grid styling in that. So you can easily enhance to using CSS grid as a layout for clients where it's supported like Apple mail outlook for Mac and whatnot. Um, so I just think this is huge news, Jason, people can be using CSS grid here in the, in the next few weeks for, for email as a part of their campaigns. I hope us at Litmus get a chance to do that, but, uh, I just think it's mind blowing that we have CSS grid supported in email now as well. Yeah. I think it's great that it's, it seems like it just hit out of nowhere. Like it's been a long time in the making, but then all of a sudden in the past month, yeah, all these web browsers get support. Email clients out of nowhere get support because those rendering engines are f- the functioning underpinnings of the layout engine. Um, but this is really cool because CSS Grid just allows you to do just layouts that you wouldn't be able to imagine handling with floats or table-based design, um, which is going to be really, really awesome to see how this develops. I think a, a great example of this is uh, there's email designer Jen Simmons uh, has a page labs.jensimmons.com uh, that she she's kind of like at the forefront of CSS grid layout. So there's some really cool experiments up here. Um, so if you want to get a taste of what we might be able to accomplish in email for email clients that support this, definitely head over there and check out some of the cool examples. Uh, I think you'll like this one. She even has uh, the Space Jam website yes, uh, yep, in, yeah, in awesome. CSS Grid, which I think is amazing. Yeah. Um, but there's really creative. It's more you can accomplish more like creative, almost magazine style layout, yes. which I think is going to be yep. absolutely fantastic. To see. And, and by the way, um, if you are like, what the heck is CSS Grid? It's OK. There are plenty of web developers who are like, oh, snap, this is a thing now. It happened real fast. So. Uh, we'll actually, let's post some links in the show notes and resources. We'll do that, sure, Jason, yeah. for some of the guides that we like about CSS Grid. And the other thing, too, I'd actually say is that, uh, and I'll, I'll 
give this in the resources as well. Mark Robbins actually has a case where you can use grid with tables as well. Mm -hmm. You just are a little bit, you know, more restricted somewhat um, because you're working with the table, but you can use CSS grid with tables as well, which is uh, really backwards, but (laughs) fascinating nonetheless. Yeah, definitely. All right. uh, Great news to hear, uh, but we're going to change subjects here and start talking a little bit about accessibility email. Uh, So this is a topic that comes up every now and then on the email design podcast more and more, I think, which is always a great thing. Uh, But Jane and Mystery publish over on the Litmus blog, The Ultimate Guide to Accessible Email. Um, So it's this really in-depth, really thorough look at all these different points that you need to consider when designing and writing copy for your email campaigns. Um, So we've talked a little bit about some of these things uh, on the podcast, the main one being the use of role presentation on your tables uh, so that screen readers don't read out the tables. They just read the content in those tables um, as if you're using something like divs or semantic HTML sectioning elements. Um, We've talked about using semantic elements for headings and paragraphs, stuff like that. Uh, But I really like that Jaina goes beyond that and talks about using color uh, intelligently. So make sure that you have really good contrast in your emails. Um, You are careful with things like animated GIFs so they don't have uh, certain patterns or flashing uh, rates that might trigger certain uh, disabilities like epilepsy. Um, and then talks about things like, you know, just basic stuff like using larger font sizes so people can read your content better, um, giving enough, using enough white space in your email designs to make sure that things are more readily, uh, devoured by your eye. I I think there's some really good tips in here for not only making your emails, uh, accessible from a coding standpoint, but from a content standpoint too. Um, that includes the, the copywriting as well. So making sure that the copy that you write is, uh, written in a very human voice and easy to understand and kind of comfortable conversational tone. Um, So definitely check this out. It's it's an absolutely fantastic write up of all the things you should be considering when trying to make more accessible emails, which everybody absolutely should be doing. Um, I know it's something that we've been trying to handle more thoughtfully too at Litmus and uh, it's it's a constant project. It's ongoing work for everybody, but it's it's a great resource. Um, along with that, there's there's another great resource that Wilbert Heinen, uh, our friend from the Netherlands, uh, put out on GitHub. Um, that's just a roundup of all these different articles, presentations, and tools for uh, thinking about and implementing accessible emails. Um, so we'll put that in the show notes too. Uh, but it's it's this great list of resources for taking your emails to the next level when it comes to accessibility. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't have much more to add other than we're trying to do it well. We're trying to create a lot of resources and shine a lot of light on this because, yeah, I think with some of the changes we've seen, especially in the web mails, Mm -hmm. it's not as harmful to use the semantic tags as it used to be from a rendering perspective. We, we, you you don't need as many resets as you used to need. Uh, And even I, who is somewhat, I guess, hesitant about it before, I'm totally comfortable using it because uh, there just aren't as many issues anymore with, with using them. So yeah, definitely research, read all these articles and resources because they're super helpful. Cool. We're going to take a quick break and remind everybody to check out all of the episodes of the podcast at emaildesignpodcast.com. Um, so you have everything from news to great interviews. We've been doing a lot of interviews lately, which I absolutely love doing. So you should absolutely check those out. Um, you can follow along on Twitter with the hashtag email design podcasts, and you can subscribe to the email design podcast on SoundCloud, iTunes, and YouTube. Um, and we also remind you that you can take litmus for a 14 day free trial, uh, just by visiting litmus.com slash gift card and using the coupon code podcast. Um, so that'll give you access to builder email analytics, uh, instant previews, all of the tools in the litmus suite uh, for email professionals to improve your email design, sending, and analytics process and workflow. Um, so definitely check those out. Just go to litmus.com slash gift card and use the coupon code podcast for a 14-day free trial. So thank you, Litmus, for uh, letting us chill for a little bit. Uh, getting back into it, let's talk about Gmail and money. Yeah, so... Uh, always a hot debate around interactive email. And this isn't necessarily interactive with using HTML or CSS, but Gmail in their uh, Android app just launched the ability to send and request money using Google Wallet. Uh, And you can see here directly uh, the GIF they have in their blog post, what this looks like. You can 
send it, you can request it. And this all happens within Gmail app on Android, all within the account, uh, which I think is very interesting. And um, Alex Williams of Trendline Interactive, he was a part of Campaign Monitor's, you know, 2017 predictions post. Mm -hmm. He actually said uh, he plans on seeing payments happening in the inbox. And I, he was actually referring to, you know, checkout processes, not necessarily just uh, Google wallet integration like this, which definitely, you know, is good cross promotional uh, opportunity for Google. But I think this is interesting because this is the foundation, Jason, that I see for that actual true checkout process Mm -hmm. happening to where the checkout part can be a part of a native function of the app through integrations of other providers. So you can easily see this happening with PayPal, with Eventbrite, with other right. vendors and providers that whom these individual apps and clients can partner with to build this native functionality. It's never going to be a part of HTML and CSS. Yeah. It's going to probably require, you know, cooperation and integration with the actual uh, email client itself. But I definitely see this becoming a thing over the next few years the only downside is there's probably going to be different variations for how everybody implements yeah, it. Yeah. Uh, and there, it'll probably be unique to each ecosystem, but I definitely see this being the foundation for happening, particularly in Gmail. Yeah, this is really interesting. I, I am curious to see if they do anything, you know, like a schema.org update or something that allows for this kind of functionality, which I th- would think be really, really cool. We've seen that for, you know, flight information, calendar stuff through schema.org. Um, so I feel like this could be the foundation for something like that. And it's, it'd be really interesting to see. Um, yeah. So once they, if they do do that, then we'll have an amazing checkout experience through emails, which would be absolutely fascinating to see brands actually take advantage of that. So we'll see. All right. Let's talk about one of my, this this is a really cool project. This is one of my favorite things that's come out in the past like week or two. Um, so one of our favorite newsletters is email weekly. Uh, it's emailweekly.co, uh, which is a great newsletter put out by the folks at action rocket. Um, that just wraps up all kinds of email industry news, design news, marketing news, um, just general tech and just weird, fun, random shit. They find online. They throw in the newsletter, absolutely great newsletter. And they've always done really interesting things with it. Um, they've done, you know, like, a, a weird auto playing music Windows 95-ish theme to it. Um, they, they always take each email and make it a very custom design thing that's really fun for people. Uh, but they're doing a live redesign of their entire newsletter. Um, so this is something, there's there's a quick little blog post on Medium that we'll point to in the show notes that kind of goes through the thinking of it. Um, but this the cool part is that they're doing the redesign completely in the open. So the first issue uh, that's part of the redesign actually hit last Friday. Um, and it was essentially just completely plain unstyled HTML for the most part. Um, so it was completely responsive because HTML, as we all know, is responsive and fluid by nature, uh, but it didn't do anything fancy with layouts. They're just getting that structure down. Um, but I think that's really interesting. So they're focusing on a few things. They're focusing on accessibility, uh, which we just kind of talked about, um, which is really cool to see. The I think the main thing that they're looking at is using actual like web code. I think Elliot referred to it as adult code or grown up code. Um, (laughs) but using, you know, like divs and, you know, I don't know if they'll touch CSS grid or anything like that, but trying to move away from tables and, uh, all the problems that outlook currently causes for us as developers. So using this, uh, more mature coding style in their campaigns, um, then a couple of different things like this stream focused design that that's more of like an app based design as, as opposed to a traditional kind of newsletter, um, and then I really like that they're still keeping this customizability in mind. So they're talking about maximum customization with a minimum amount of code. Um, so still having those hooks in there so that they can do really fun, uh, creative things with the design of the email with minimal effort. So it's, it's really cool to see the, the behind the scenes thinking that's going into this, but even cooler to subscribe to the email and actually see that happen over the course of the next couple of weeks. Um, so I'm curious to see what they actually send tomorrow and how how it's developed since that plain HTML version from last week. So you should absolutely subscribe to email weekly at emailweekly.co and follow along. Yeah. I, this is such a cool project. It's, it's so meta for sure. Yeah, which is probably yeah. why we love it, but I think it's just a great thing. I mean, talk about 
getting this is just a great marketing tool, right? Mm -hmm. This all of a sudden puts attention on the newsletter and it's so cool. You're building out in the open. I'm really a big proponent and and fan of building out in the open, designing out in the open and sort of showing people your process. People love to see that sort of thing. So uh, I'm definitely going to be tuned into this. It's one of, you know, when we have guests on the podcast, people always mention this is one of their favorites. It's one of our favorites. So it'll be very cool to see. And uh, yeah, I'll definitely just sort of back up and support the the moving away from tables, moving to a more div approach. Definitely, mm-hmm. you feel free when you do it. Yeah. You might feel a little <laughs> feels <naked>. good. Yeah, <laughs> you might feel a little naked without those hard tables around you, but it feels good. Um, so yeah, I'm very interested to see how this turns out. And uh, kudos to Email Weekly and the Action Rocket crew. Yeah. Or taxi for email crew. Even. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, it's all like the taxi for email crew. Yeah. It's all like all. Of, I know they're two separate, but yeah. Anyways, <laughs> uh, all right. Let's get into our email of the week. Um, it seems like we're always bringing up these these emails, but Burberry sends just so many good emails. Yeah, I feel like we need to get a tally going of how many times we feed. Yeah, and and we still don't even know the people over yeah, there yet. We need to make like, friends. Yeah, we need to. Yeah, we need to get them on the podcast. But uh, this one is a great one. So this one is actually uh, it's an interactive slideshow. Um, so you could say it's a carousel, but what I like about it is it's not just a dumb carousel. It's really a smart carousel that really is an experience that takes you through the runway as if you were actually there. Uh, So it starts out to, you can take a look at the show showing off the new products. And I think it's a great design, has great imagery and even great use of the text. Now, granted, um, a lot of this is image based, so it may not necessarily be uh, the greatest in terms of uh, accessibility, but you know, the actual core actions of the buttons and whatnot that you can take are there. So I love that you can shop for each product as you sort of go through, Mm -hmm. or you can continue on with the runway, uh, which is really, really cool. And I think what's a nice user enhancement is this entire slide is really the label that clicks to the next one. Mm -hmm. So you don't even necessarily have to click on the next arrow. You could just be on the main image and it'll click to the next one. Um, But it does such a great job of highlighting, showcasing the products, very unique design, very visual, really shows off each product very well. And I mean, there's a ton of slides, but then when you get to the end, it's a great shop now and you can either shop for men or women, um, which is great. Probably would have been a nice enhancement if they could have personalized that if they had known, but granted, I'm sure that's a very hard task for probably their entire scriber base. Um, But you could even restart once you get to the very end of the slideshow. But I just thought this was a very unique email. I haven't really quite seen an implementation like this or a concept of showcasing products in this way through a runway like experience i thought it was very elegant and very well done yeah i really like this i think the only thing i would have loved to have seen is more like you mentioned it's it's pretty much all image based um so if there was a way to you know take out that copy and put it on top of like a background image or something would be cool um because then i could see them doing something that they've done before which is that kind of zoom effect um that kind of like ken burns style zooming slow moving Mm. imagery and i feel like if you combine that with the images on the runway that make it an even more immersive experience it's almost like you're like walking down the runway with the models or something like that um that's that's pretty nitpicky uh this is yeah definitely another great campaign from burberry um yeah, I don't. I don't have much to say. Say beyond that, I, I think the imagery is fantastic. The functionality is great. It, it works well on mobile and stuff. So yeah, kudos Burberry yet again. Yeah, and it's it's a great uh, great email to sort of dissect the code. Yeah. and take a look as to what's going on. Um, all of their emails are pretty much like that yep. for the most part. So uh, yeah, awesome job Burberry again. And it's it's stuff like this, Jason, where it's not always about the actual implementation, right? Mm -hmm. Like we probably would have done it a a little bit differently, but it's really when you take a look at what they're doing from a design strategy perspective, that's unique about this, right? Um, You need to be able to approach emails and be like, Oh, what can we do in email? And it's not always, Oh, hero section, S curve design. Like this sort of breaks it out and makes it unique a bit, even if it can't be supported everywhere. The fact that they're taking this approach, I think, I think that's why we like these emails, right? Is that, they're sort of approaching the design problem entirely differently than the norm. Totally agree. Uh, so that's why we got to give them props. So, 
All right, that's going to do it for this edition of the Email Design Podcast. Don't forget, emaildesignpodcast.com. Check out all the articles we talked about, show notes, links, past episodes, all right there. Subscribe on SoundCloud, YouTube, and iTunes. We got you covered. Tweet along with the hashtag Email Design Podcast. And don't forget, free 14-day trial of Litmus. Just go to litmus.com slash gift card and input the coupon code podcast. All right, until next time, guys, go check out CSS Grid. Get on it. You'll really like it.